Welcome to this event, which is hosted by the Francis Crick Institute. Uh, it's sure to be a really interesting evening. I'm Claudia Hammond, and I'm the presenter of Health Check and the Evidence on BBC World Service, both global health programmes, um, and also All in the Mind on BBC Radio 4. And it is lovely to be here again, even at a distance, for World Immunology Day. Now, today's event is a joint venture between the Crick Nature Research and the British Society for Immunology. So just to fill you in on what they all do. The Francis Crick Institute is a biomedical discovery institute which researches the biology underlying human health. Um, in its laboratories in central London, which many of you may have seen if you've been to London right next to St Pancras Station in a, in a beautiful building, the scientists are working to understand why disease develops and how to translate their discoveries into new ways to present, prevent and diagnose illnesses ranging from cancer, heart disease, stroke, infections and all sorts of other diseases. But it's not just about doing research in their labs in their building. The Crick is committed to engaging and inspiring the public with that research. So this event is part of a busy programme of educa education, outreach and community partnerships and events and exhibitions, uh, both online and, of course, where possible um, in person. Uh, Nature Research the, uh, is, of course, one of the leading science journals in the world, and the British Society for Immunology is a membership organisation that represents scientists and clinicians who study the immune system in health and disease. Now, one of their key aims is to improve public understanding and engagement with how the immune system works, and they're delighted to support uh, this event tonight. And Today, we are celebrating the International Day of Immunology, something I think we all need to be very grateful for these days. Um, this day is dedicated to increasing global awareness of the importance of immunology in the fight against infection um, and in autoimmunity and, and cancer. Now, I don't think there's been a year where the words immunity and vaccines and T cells and antibodies have been discussed more. Um, only this week, I made my, I think, 92nd, if I can't sleep, I work it out, my 92nd radio programme on COVID-19. Um, and so I have been doing those every week and, and more than every week. Um, and like many people, the time I've spent looking at graphs of infection rates around the world has increased exponentially. And of course, we've all been reminded this year how crucial vaccines are to all of us. So for this year's event, we are celebrating vaccines and discussing them in depth. Um, later on, we will be discussing COVID vaccines in particular, but before that, in the first half, we're going to look at other vaccines and their history. Um, so that's what we're all doing here, but we're interested in you and knowing why you've decided to join us this evening. So we thought we would make the most of Zoom rather than being in a room um, and make the most of the technology and do a quick poll. Um, so this poll will come up now and we're going to ask you to tell us which of the following best describes you and your interest in this event. So the choices we have are school or college student, university student, uh, media, scientist or science or healthcare worker, interested member of the public, I imagine we have a lot of those or other. Um, so um, do tick one of those and submit it now um, and that would be um, that would be great and it'll be interesting to see what um, what results uh, come up there. But in this event we're going to explore the power and the impact of vaccines. So um, in a moment, we're going to hear from one of uh, the Crick's uh, senior scientists who will give us an introductory talk on vaccines. Then we'll have a panel discussion in which we'll explore the subject in more detail and there'll be opportunities for you to ask your questions. Um, so do put your questions um, on general vaccines, which we're going to concentrate on first, into the uh, Q&A and we'll see how many of those we can tackle um, with our panel. And then later on, there will be a chance to ask about COVID vaccines as well. I'm sure people will have lots of um, questions about those. Um, and um, I'm wondering if the polling results may come up in a moment. We'll see when those um, come up. Oh, here they are. So um, interestingly, almost an equal split between scientists or healthcare workers and interested members of the public um, and uh, some uh, students as well, which is nice to see and some other. We'll never know what the others are, but thank you for fill it, filling in that. Uh, very interesting. So first of all, I would like to introduce Andreas um, Wack, who is uh, Wack, who is a senior group leader at the Francis Crick Institute. Um, and Andreas Wack is going to talk to us about what vaccines are and the history of their success. Thanks, Andreas. 
Thanks very much, Claudia, and um, hello to everyone out there. Thanks for tuning in. So the um, plan is for the next um, 10 minutes or 10, 12 minutes, I'm going to um, discuss with you a little bit what vaccines are, why they work so well, and a little bit of their history. And um, I hope that this is up now. So vaccines, um, why are they so good? Um, so essentially, before we go there, the first question that I want to really discuss with you is not yet about vaccines, but it's a much more natural pro process. And that is really the question on why we get most infections in our lives only once. And the answer to this in, in one term is really the immune memory that we develop in the first infection. And this is what I want to discuss with you in a few slides and display, explain you a little bit how that actually works. So just to make sure that we all know what um, this will be um, about. When I say immune response, we will concentrate tonight on antibodies, these Y-shaped uh, molecules that float around in our blood and um, other body fluids. And um, antibodies are really um, a central part to uh, protect us from infection. And how that works is essentially shown here. So when a virus um, infects the organism and the organism is made of cells, so it has to get into a cell, what usually happens is that um, there is a surface structure on the virus that will bind to the receptor on a cell. And this is essentially the first step for the infection to happen. Now, if antibodies recognize this part here and can essentially occupy the space that the virus would use to bind to the receptor, then the virus can block this invasion and therefore the infection and can um, essentially block um, the, the whole disease process. So we're very interested in antibodies and you've heard a lot about them in the last um, year. And uh, this um, plot here really describes what happens in, these, um, in an infection and I will go uh, go through this really step by step. So if you get an infection for the first time, uh, so this is a time axis here, we see what happens over time to the amounts of antibodies. So this indicates the antibody um, amounts essentially. When you get an infection for the first time, what you notice here is that for the first days of the infection, apparently not much happens in terms of antibodies. So at least they don't go up, they don't show up in the blood. Um, lots of things are actually happening, but you can't yet pick them up. And the reason for this is really um, the way the immune system is um, constructed and you can uh, compose and you can see that here. So um, a really important um, aspect of the immune system is diversity. And here what you see, these are different cells. They're called B cells. They are the white, um, uh, one of the white blood cells in the blood. These are the cells that can produce antibodies. And as you can see here, um, by this color code, um, I've made them all in different colors because it's really, I mean, one of the really miraculous things of the immune system that all each and every B cell can make an antibody that is different to the one made by another cell. So this antibody here will recognize a different thing to this antibody here. So that essentially means you have a huge repertoire of very diverse um, cells and antibodies already present in your, in your blood. And they are sort of the life insurance for the future because the antibody for your next five infections is, are already present in one way or another in your blood. Um, so you have a huge diversity here. And then when a virus comes along and you will notice this virus here is dark blue. So essentially the antibody that can recognize it is this dark blue antibody and uh, made by this cell here. It takes some time for the matchmaking. So essentially out of this huge amount of different cells, this one rare cell that can recognize the virus has to um, kind of be uh, found, um, activated, and uh, what you see here is then these cells start to divide, they become more and more, they get activated and produce a lot of antibody, and this is what happens um, in an immune response. Now, essentially, so the delay that I've shown you here is really this matchmaking period where you have to pull out the few rare cells out of this huge mix of different cells with different um, specificities, uh, making different antibodies to, um, uh, to get started. Uh, these cells will then produce antibody. You see they go up and up. Uh, as a consequence, in this phase, essentially, um, the virus um, or the bacterial infection will be blocked. Um, essentially, at this point, more or less, the, the disease will be over. Um, that leads to, uh, so you will feel better. That leads to, uh, there's no need to produce more antibody anymore. And even the antibody amounts will go down quite a bit towards the end of the infection. 
Now, when you look at what happens at the second infection, when you get the same infection for the second time, you, you notice that the response is much faster and much stronger. And you also notice you don't have this long delay phase here in the beginning. So how does that work? So this is what I've shown you just before. Essentially, where we are at the beginning of the second infection is a situation like this. So you still have the diversity that you had in the beginning, you, all these different colored cells here. But now you can see the dark blue cells are much more frequent. So you have many more of them in this mix to start with. And you also have already uh, quite a lot of these dark blue antibodies made already. This essentially means that the matchmaking is not necessary. The cells are already there. They are also different to the cells um, they, as they were the first time around, so they can produce antibody much more rapidly, and you get this really, really fast uh, response. So essentially, the second time around, the response is faster and stronger, and this is why you don't get the same infection twice in your life normally. Now, vaccines essentially try to plug into this um, natural process and um, are supposed to work exactly the same way. So um, you replace the first infection by the vaccination and thereby you educate the antibody response um, of your immune system, but you do that without the risks that are always attached with um, infection, uh, which um, can also be long term. So the basic principle really of vaccines, of any vaccine ever made um, in, in, in human history, is that they are as similar as possible to the infecting bacterium or virus, but at the same time they are harmless. And so one way to show this is rather than having this devilish infection here, you have something that is, um, the vaccine is something that is similar, but it's a little bit softer. So how can you um, render viruses or bacteria harmless to use them in a vaccine? So the first thing that you need is you need to, um, to be able to link um, a disease to a specific um, bacterium or virus. You have to be able to grow um, these in, in a test tube. And then you can do different things. You can either just kill them. And um, that's what we call inactivated um, vaccines. Um, you can make them less infectious by a process that is called attenuation, which is complicated, so I won't explain it now for reasons of time. Um, you can split them up by, by chemical processes and just use pieces of the, um, of the virus or bacterium, and that's called subunit vaccines. And here you can really see the last century was really the, the high time of uh, developing vaccines. Uh, there have been uh, many that were developed. They all follow essentially one of these principles here. They were made both against viruses and bacteria. And um, so I want to spend a couple of slides now on smallpox because that is really a, a, the biggest um, success story of vaccination because it is a disease that we were able to really get rid of entirely. Now, you probably have heard the name of Edward Jenner, who is one of the pioneers of this, but uh, smallpox have been with humans and have been plaguing humans for virtually for millennia. And therefore, um, the human population has really developed ways to protect themselves from, um, from smallpox that go much further back. So it's known for, from, from uh, written accounts from travelers, really, that for centuries, um, um, a practice called variolation was used in India and in China, in the Middle East, in African countries, in Sudan, in Ethiopia. And um, the trick here is essentially you take a patient that has the smallpox and they get these pustules. You take a little bit of pus or the, the crust on these pustules. Uh, if it's the crust, you grind them up, you dilute them in, in liquid, and then you put this liquid onto little pin pricks or uh, cuts that you do on the person that you want to protect. And essentially, you do, again, the same thing that you do with any other vaccine. Um, you put something that is really similar to the disease, but is not harmful anymore. So this was in practice in Constantinople. And this is where the um, writer and uh, wife of the UK ambassador um, at the time to the Ottoman Empire, Lady Montague, came about this. Uh, she was really enthusiastic. She got both her children variolated and brought this back to the UK. And so um, starting from the 1730s, throughout the 18th century, this really became a widespread um, practice in the UK as well. Now, the safety profile of this wasn't really um, great. It would not uh, live up to our safety standards this day. 1% of people would actually get the proper disease from it. So it was a risky thing. 
and therefore um, a better vaccine was um, needed. And so Edward Jenner comes into um, the, the picture. He was a doctor and he um, based essentially what he tried out on, on common knowledge. And that was that dairy maids, who of course spent quite a lot of time with cows. They would sometimes pick up um, the cowpox from these cows. And that's a very mild disease in these dairy maids. However, um, the, the, um, the no knowledge among country folk was that these dairy maids, if they had the cowpox, they would never get smallpox. And so Jenner wanted to try that out more systemically. So he essentially inoculated a boy with cowpox. And uh, that's what we call vaccination because vaca is the cow in Latin. So stuff from the cow put into the boy would uh, protect him from smallpox. So again, we find this principle that vaccines um, are as similar as possible. It is a similar virus that causes cowpox as compared to smallpox, but harmless. There were more modern vaccines, there were huge campaigns going on, and um, essentially in 1979, uh, the World Health Organization declared Africa um, smallpox free, and therefore uh, this was the last continent to be smallpox free in 1980, um, smallpox was gone from the surface of the planet, which of course is an amazing success. Now, there are more diseases that are on their way out. Um, so they are listed here. In all these cases, there are wonderful vaccines that work really quite well. But um, no need to tell anyone sitting at home rather than being out there. There are emerging diseases, of course. Um, SARS-CoV-2 um, is not on here. COVID is not on here because um, the review is older. But what is also important is there are really the, the three big killers among the um, infectious diseases are TB, HIV, AIDS, and malaria. And as you can see here from the red line, um, each of them kills uh, more than a million people every year still, and we don't have vaccines against them. So there's still a lot of work to be done. And um, the same, of course, goes for COVID, but we will discuss that um, more in detail later. Here, I just want to give an overview on um, how do COVID vaccines work. So of the principles that I've shown you before, um, essentially two are um, being in, um, are in vaccines that are on their way to be licensed, um, approved and licensed, and will be out very soon. So one is the whole virus inactivated um, vaccine, and the other one is a subunit vaccine. But then the trick of the two um, principles of vaccinations that are already out there is actually a different one. And that is you don't take a part of the virus itself, but you only take the blueprint, the recipe, if you want. So you don't put in the cake, you put in just the recipe for the cake. And uh, since the blueprint in this virus is um, uh, made by um, RNA, a nucleic acid, um, this is essentially what you do. So you can either um, put the RNA molecule itself that um, gives the recipe for the uh, surface protein, uh, put this into a lipid droplet, inject it into people, and uh, this will then uh, be uh, turned into a protein and uh, can cause the immune um, response. Or you put this gene into a common cold virus, which is essentially used as a vector, and that is uh, what we use as well. So this is essentially BioNTech. This is um, um, Oxford um, University. And um, just to finish, essentially, there are two things I want to say. Why do we give vaccines twice often? So again, essentially, this exact same principle and the same curves apply that I've shown you before. So sometimes when you give a vaccine, you get a decent antibody response, but maybe you're not quite happy with how high the antibody response is and also how long lasting it is. So you can then simply give a vaccine a second time and then with the same principles of um, the more frequent cells that I've shown you before, you get a faster and stronger response um, after the what is called the booster vaccination, so the second vaccination. And it's particularly important in uh, groups where we know you get a, a weaker and a slower immune response, and that is, for instance, the elderly. So um, a lot of vaccinations are really um, required twice for the elderly to give you full protection. So vaccines are not only great because they protect you, but they protect everyone around you as well. So the you know that the pandemic is bigger than an individual and vaccination is also bigger than an individual really. So, and this is nicely illustrated here and I will just go through this quickly. Um, so if you have a completely um, non-vaccinated population and you have this one um, unfortunate um, individual here getting infected, this person here can um, transmit on the, the disease to everyone around them because none of them is protected in any shape. And they can then give it, um, transmit it on, hand it on to others. And in the end, um, practically the whole population will get this disease. 
if you vaccinate um, a certain amount of people, um, things that's good, it's maybe not good enough, but it is better because now um, sometimes this um, infected person will um, meet someone who is already protected. So there won't be no transmission, uh, but many others still are. So we will slow down the spread of the, um, and, uh, the um, disease throughout the population, but you still get quite a lot of people getting um, infected essentially. Uh, if you get really a lot of people vaccinated, then you see that essentially this infected person here will not be able to transmit on the disease because everyone around them is protected by the vaccine. And the few people that are in the population who are not vaccinated, either because they don't want to or they can't be vaccinated for medical reasons, uh, the likelihood that he will encounter them is so low that it essentially um, will not happen. And therefore you stop the, uh, the spread of the um, disease and um, it cannot happen anymore. So this is what we call herd protection or herd immunity. And this is essentially what we are aiming for with this huge vaccination program against COVID at the moment. So that's really all I wanted to tell you. Thanks very much for your attention. I'm sure there are lots of questions. Please write them in and we will try to answer as many of those as we can. Thank you very much, Andreas. You managed to pack an enormous amount of information into there. That was that. Yeah, was I hope I impressive. didn't kill anyone in the process. No, no, it's very good. Thank you. That's impressive. Um, so what we're going to do now is to start our, our panel discussion. So I'd like to welcome our panel for this evening, which includes Andreas. Um, so I wonder if I can ask each of you to introduce yourselves and, and what you do, how your work is, is connected with vaccines. Um, could we start with um, Peter Hotez? Thank you yeah. so much. Yes, uh, it's, it's an honor to be here and uh, appreciated the, the remarks by Andreas. Uh, I'm a, an MD, PhD, pediatrician scientist who develops vaccines. Uh, de we develop vaccines for neglected tropical diseases, and we adopted a coronavirus vaccine program about a decade ago because they were orphaned just like neglected disease vaccines were. So, And now um, we've been accelerating a low-cost recombinant protein uh, vaccine for COVID-19 uh, in India with Biological E, where they're scaling it up to a billion doses. So that's very exciting for us. And so I'm a vaccine scientist. I co-direct the Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development. I'm also an academic. I'm a, the professor and dean of the, our National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine, all, all located in Houston, Texas. Thank you for that, Peter. And I'd like to also welcome um, Teresa Lamb. Teresa, could you come on and introduce yourself? Thank you. Sure, and thank you very much for having me here tonight. Um, I'm Teresa Lamb. I'm an associate professor at the University of Oxford. Um, my research group are really interested in understanding the immunology or the biology of infectious diseases. And we use that information to help us make vaccines against emerging and outbreak pathogens. Um, I'm one of the co-developers of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, and I've worked in that program. It's taken over my life for the last year. I'm not surprised, but a lot of us are very, very grateful to you for the fact that it has taken over your life. But yes, I'm not surprised uh, if it has. Um, and uh, Andreas, we've met just now, but can you tell us about your work, Andreas? Yeah. So I'm, um, I'm an immunologist as well, like Teresa. So I'm really on, not on the virus side, but on the host side, like her. We try to, I work in the crick and we try to understand how the um, host responds to, a, to an infection. Um, can be a force for good or can be a force for bad and um, try to understand rules and uh, potentially also intervene um, so that things get better. So there are lots of things that I'd like to um, ask you all. Um, and if I can start with you, Peter, um, Andreas mentioned that there are, are some diseases, you know, the big, big killers like HIV, TB and malaria, that it seems very hard to create vaccines for. And I noticed there was some good news just last week on the malaria front with positive results of a, of a phase two trial. So not the final trials, but some positive trials that came out. But why don't we have vaccines against all infections when we, we do know how to make vaccines, Peter? Well, that's right. So the, you know, the we're in this situation where the technical, uh, our technical ability to actually develop vaccines has outpaced our social and political and financial instruments to, to actually make that happen. And this is particularly a problem for vaccines for global health, uh, because many of these disease, the diseases uh, that, that we're interested in, for instance, only affect the poorest of the poor living in sub-Saharan Africa and in, in impoverished parts of Latin America and, and Asia. And there's, there's a huge market for these 
illnesses, but not a commercial market for these illnesses because the, no one really, when it comes to actually paying for the development and the uh, and the distribution of the vaccines, people do this. They, they, they everyone points to the other of, of who should pay for it. And so this, this has been uh, one, one of the great tragedies because especially for diseases that are of regional importance, but not global importance. For instance, we're making a schistosomiasis vaccine that affects uh, 90% of the cases occur in, in a, on the African continent. And the big pharma companies are not prepared to take something like that on or a vaccine for sleeping sickness or beruli ulcer. So that's one of the problems is, is the market failure and the sustainable finance model. Uh, and and because of that, I often tell my, uh, you know, oftentimes after, if this were a live event and we were all here in person, there'd be a small group of students coming up, to talk to me afterwards. And they'd say, hey, Professor Hotez, I'm all in. How do I do, what, what should I do to work on these global health vaccines? And they're profoundly disappointed when I uh, suggest they get some business training and economics training, because we need as much innovation in the finance sector as, as we need in, in, in the science. I mean, there are scientific challenges uh, there, there, of course, as well. So, um, and, and then there are certainly the, the technical, complicated technical hurdles, especially for complex eukaryotic pathogens, which have genomes the size of the human genome. So a trypanosome or leishmania parasite or a schistosome has a genome as every bit as large as the human genome. And so identifying mechanisms for doing the, the informatics, the bioinformatics to fine tune that and to conduct these reverse vaccinology approaches. This is what we try to do, but it doesn't go as quickly for some of our complicated parasites as it would say for a bacterial pathogen where we do have proof of concept from Reno Raprioli's work and others that it's possible. So what's the difficulty when there has been a lot of work done and there is the will to do it because because so many people are affected but why does it take so long with things like say HIV and, and malaria it seems to have been difficult scientifically to do those. Well I think the world we, we got a little bit spoiled um, because it turns out developing a COVID-19 vaccine is is not so complicated because you know we and other groups have shown that the spike protein is the soft target of of the of of coronaviruses and if you can find ways to induce high levels of virus neutralizing antibody <laughs> as as Andreas described as well as T cell responses you'll get a covid uh, vaccine and so that's been that's helped us move relatively quickly and in some ways it's, it's hard to it's hard to say this when we're in such dire straits with this pandemic we we got a bit lucky i mean what if the, the SARS-2 coronavirus had been as complicated a target as say the malaria pathogen or or the, the mycobacterium that causes tuberculosis or, or HIV AIDS where we've been chipping away at or, or our schistosomiasis where we've been chipping away at this for 20 years or more and and only now are we coming up with prototype vaccines that potentially are are, are promising and so they're so many not all pathogens are, are straightforward as say COVID-19. So, Teresa, we'll talk more uh, later on about your work on the now very famous Oxford AstraZeneca um, COVID vaccine. But can you tell us a bit about your experience in developing vaccines against outbreaks and also emerging diseases before you were working on COVID? Sure. So um, my bread and butter before emerging outbreak pathogens was influenza and um, influenza or flu. Um, we need yearly annual shots, and that's because this is a virus that changes very regularly. Um, as we're seeing SARS-CoV-2 is also changing and mutating a little. Um, so I was involved in a vaccine assessment during the Ebola outbreak in 2013, 2016. And after that outbreak, a number of government bodies in the WHO basically made a hit list of those viruses that they thought the next pandemic would come from. Um, and some of those everybody in the audience will have heard of, Ebola, um, Zika, and some people won't have heard of, uh, like, uh, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, which is a bit of a mouthful. So what I did and my colleagues, we all got together and we started making vaccines against these emerging or outbreak pathogens. But the one pathogen that was on the list that we needed a technology to develop a vaccine against was disease X. So the unknown, the one that nobody could guess um, was coming. If you'd asked me back then what it was going to be, I would have said flu. I would have been wrong and I would have lost a lot of money. 
<laughs> regardless, um, we had been working on viral vectored vaccines and that as a platform technology. And that's a big mouthful. So what do I mean by viral vectored vaccines? I mean, we take another virus, so an adenovirus, a cold virus, and we cripple it. So we render it unable to cause infection anymore. And then we use it almost like a Trojan horse. We use it to carry a very small part of whatever virus we're trying to protect against. So for example, the part that we chose that Peter's already alluded to that most vaccines are using is a spike, the protein that is found on the outside of SARS-CoV-2, because we were hopeful that a strong immune response against a small part of SARS-CoV-2 would protect us against disease. So those are the kind of things that I do on a regular basis. I design and test vaccines against all the wonderful diseases you probably haven't heard of. And Andreas, you work on, on flu vaccines uh, too. And I remember sometime, at the start of the pandemic, sometimes we heard people saying, oh, it's only like flu. But of course, flu can be fatal too. Why is something like flu so, why does it affect different people so variably at different times? Yeah, I think there are, I mean, there are a number of reasons. One is the virus itself. So flu is not equal to flu. There are what's called the high, pass, high pathogenic strains, um, avian flu. Um, so the, the problem can be on the virus side. They really come in nasty shape or in not so nasty shape. The second is really the uh, kind of medical conditions, let's say, of, of different people. So, I mean, an important thing, of course, in flu is um, the most vulnerable age groups are at the two extremes, so very young kids and very old people. Um, but then there are other medical conditions that would um, render you potentially more, um, more vulnerable to flu. And I think the third one is um, really very trivial, and that's uh, people are different. So some are blonde, some are brown, um, some run fast, some are slow. Um, and the same goes for our immune system. It's not identical. I think everyone who has kids know that um, they may have one who gets a really high fever and another one who never gets high fever. So it is um, essentially, you could argue the surprise that a lot of people or the kind of repeated phrase that we got, oh, in COVID, it can look so different and it's um, essentially the same virus. Um, that's not really something new for anyone who studies um, infections. And um, uh, so for, for people from the flu world, that was certainly known. But then of course, a very overriding thing in the flu world, and that's different to, to COVID-19, um, is have you been exposed to the virus in any shape before? So have you been vaccinated? Did you have the flu before? And if the answer to this is yes, then uh, a lot of what I've showed in the 10 minutes uh, would apply to you. And so you are protected. So that's a very strong factor that sort of overrides the, the difference between different people. And for COVID, this um, doesn't apply in general, maybe in some exceptional mechanisms, but uh, all of us are unprepared for this virus. And therefore you pick up these um, individual hardwired differences between us in our immune system, you pick that up much more. And of course, the flu vaccine, we're used to the fact that the flu vaccine changes every year. Um, why, is, why is that necessary to, to keep on changing it? So flu virus, as um, Theresa already mentioned, the flu virus um, mutates quite a bit, um, probably more than coronavirus, which is sort of good news these days, I guess. Um, flu virus has a very different way to, um, to organize its genes, so it can juggle around genes uh, very easily. Um, and I think the other really important thing about um, <clears throat> flu is um, flu lives in a lot of different animals. So um, that essentially means um, whenever you kind of stem it back in the, in the human population, um, there are always places where flu goes on, flu keeps changing, and it can come back from, um, from these animal reservoirs. And that's what happened in 2009. Uh, everyone was staring at, um, at um, birds because we were waiting for an avian flu and then it came out of pigs. So um, that's how viruses um, surprise us. But uh, that is essentially, so the, the, the fact that the virus changes all the time means that you have to adapt um, the, the, the vaccine to it all the time as well. And there's, I mean, there's a massive 
global surveillance system of um, new flu strains coming along and uh, the WHO meets twice per year for each hemisphere because they travel in different ways in the hemispheres and they're seasonal so the seasons are of course different. Um, so essentially uh, the, um, the flu strains that end up in our winter's um, flu vaccine are decided in February by the WHO based on the data that's coming out of um, a lot out of um, far out, out of the Far East, out of China, and it's educated guesswork, and it sometimes works well, and it sometimes doesn't work well. And um, I wouldn't be surprised that if with COVID we end up in a in a fairly similar place in terms of um, ongoing global surveillance and maybe booster shots um, regularly. Yeah, and maybe through through educated guesswork again. Yeah. Now we've got lots of yeah. um, lots of audience uh, questions uh, that I want to take, and there's some um, there's some interesting ones actually actually asking what things certain things mean, which I think might be useful in our discussion going on as well. Um, uh, Tess, let me ask you this one. Stephanie says I've read papers about neutralizing antibodies. What is a neutralizing antibody, and is that different from just antibodies on their own? Really good question. So um, if we think about the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, the way that it gets into a cell is it uses a, its spike protein, so a small part of the outside of the virus binds onto the cell and gets in that way. And a neutralizing antibody effectively stops that. So it neutralizes the virus getting into the cell. And not all antibodies will stop that interaction. They will work in different ways. So what they can do is they can bind to the virus and essentially act as a signal for other cells to come along and clean up the mess to an extent. So you've got different types of antibodies, different mechanisms of action, but most vaccinologists like to keep things simple and they really like making a vaccine that induces neutralizing antibodies. Because then you stop the infection in its track because the virus can't get into the cell, it can't get into your body and it can't make you poorly. And uh, Peter, I wonder if you can answer this question from Kay. Why do some people have a much stronger reaction to the vaccine than others? Um, and will an, an initial strong response to a first jab mean an equally bad reaction to a second jab if, if people have side effects afterwards? Well, we don't have all the details, but one observation has been that individuals who've been infected and recovered uh, may have a stronger reaction to the vaccine. And that may be partly because the initial infection and recovery has already primed our immune system to recognize this virus. It almost acts like a first dose of vaccine. So your first dose after you've been uh, infected and recovered um, acts like other people's second dose. So the second dose is often uh, creates more problems in terms of reactogenicity as it's called fever or headache or fatigue for 24 hours uh, than, than otherwise. And, and, and that may have something to do with it. Also, uh, younger age groups sometimes respond more vigorously than, than older age groups. So for instance, um, some of the highest virus neutralizing antibody titers that test des described are a and with the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine actually occur in the adolescents. They have some of the highest uh, immune responses. And, and, that's, and that's not too surprising because old, you know, school-age children, adolescents, it, as, as every parent knows, when they get a virus or they get sick, they often get very, very high fevers, much higher than you would expect from, from an older adult. And so, so it's a combination of age, it's a combination of pre-exposure, and then there's a lot of genetic components to host responses that we're only beginning to uh, fully un fully understand. And there's a whole a there's a whole branch of immunogenetics and um, even precision immunology, as it's called, or precision vaccinology, that's trying to understand why one person responds differently than another. And um, Andreas, you mentioned smallpox, and we'll all remember your, your description of the, the pustules and so on. Um, but uh, here's an interesting question. Why does the smallpox vaccination give such a distinctive scar? Do you know? Uh, it is. Um, so anyone who's seen people who actually have the, the, the smallpox, they get lots and lots of scars. So it's like um, it's like the, a mini, mini, mini disease um, that you um, get um, very similar to the, to, the, to the real disease, but on a much, much reduced scale. So I think this is what is behind the, the scar that you get 
it's like um, the the one scar that you get rather than hundreds and hundreds that you would get if you got the proper disease. And uh, you were talking as well, Andres, in your talk about um, uh, immune responses and uh, and how the second time you encounter something, you'll get a, a better response, a quicker response. Um, and Henry says, how can you explain immune responses in one shot vaccines compared with two? How does it work when there's only one shot? So they, um, you just induce an antibody response and you essentially need then to decide whether or not you think that this is good enough. And to be quite honest, I mean, maybe maybe Teresa can comment on this. Um, I do not know how the companies actually decide, um, should we give our vaccine only once or, or twice? Um, I think it is pretty fair to say that any vaccine, if you even those that are designed to be given only once, if you gave it a second time, there's a high likelihood that you will get higher antibody amounts. Um, so it is really um, a cutoff between what's feasible, what is easier, of course. I mean, you can use the, the same doses for double the amount of people if one is enough, um, but you need to know what is enough. And certainly one of the, I mean, to come back to COVID as we were often tonight, uh, we don't know really what is a protective level of antibodies. Um, so there is this um, rather pompous word of um, correlates of protection. For a lot of diseases, you don't exactly know. So you get um, a better immune response. You know the person is protected, but the immune response do, consists of many different things. So not only of the antibodies I've shown, but also T cells, et cetera, et cetera. And you don't necessarily know that it's not so easy to know which specific function of your immune response uh, is crucial to protect you. Um, so um, it's a little bit of. Um, I, I can also I can also add that, you know, we we actually do not have very many single dose vaccines if you think about it, uh, and the ones yeah. that are are pretty much all live virus vaccines like yellow fever vaccine, or the smallpox vaccine, and. And quite honestly, when I looked at the J and J data, the Johnson and Johnson data, the the antibody titers and the virus neutralizing antibodies are far more impressive when you get two doses than exactly. one dose. So, so I think it's going to be, turn out to be a more robust vaccine as a two dose vaccine, ultimately, like the AstraZeneca vaccine, and it probably will do a better job against the variant. So, don't be surprised if if word comes down later on that to recommend a second dose. I think believe there are phase three clinical trials in progress now with, with two, oh, doses two doses of that vaccine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Tess, is there anything you want to add about one versus two and, and how, you, how you decide which to trial? I think it's really important to go back to the correlates of protection question. Um, and I think that's a big unanswered question that we have at the moment. I think everybody is banking on it being antibodies and neutralizing antibodies. And that's where I put my money too. But there are other cells that we need to not forget about T cells. But until we have this correlate of protection, it's going to be almost harder for other vaccines to get to market to be available. And having this indication that this correlate, this level of antibody protects you against this virus is hugely important because it means we can have more vaccines, we can protect more of the world, and we, we can vaccinate individuals and see how long that level of antibody lasts, so you can infer how long individuals will be protected. When you've got variants of concern, those correlates will change. And what I mean by variants of concern are these different viruses, the mutated viruses from the original SARS-CoV-2. And we may need a different correlate there. We may need higher antibody titers from the original vaccines that we've used. And so it is, of course, the case that while we're discussing vaccines, we always come back to um, COVID again, inevitably. and um, uh, and of course, if you just say the word vaccine now, um, COVID is, is tend to everyone tends to assume that is the vaccine um, you mean. And of course, we're, we're all very interested in that now. I, I must say a few weeks ago, I cycled faster than I ever do when I had a message saying that there were some leftovers that needed using up at a, at a mosque that was about half an hour from me. And they were so efficient when I got there that there was no time to lock my bike up. They would say, no, you've got to come in, you've got to come in. And a lovely volunteer guarded it for me, which I was very pleased about. Um, the Crick has very much been involved in the pandemic response and early on they repurposed labs and started using in-house um, equipment to support the NHS with diagnostic uh, testing which helped keep 10 local hospitals and 150 care homes open and, and safe and meanwhile researchers there are investigating some of the urgent questions that we have about COVID-19 and we'll hear a bit more about that later um, but 
if you've been to the uh, Crick, there's a public gallery on the ground floor which houses exhibitions and it's open to everyone. Um, and currently it's home now to a large scale vaccination centre run by uh, University College London hospitals and more than 300 Crick staff have been volunteering there and 30,000 people have had their vaccines. So I want to move on to talking about COVID vaccines in particular. Several have been licensed, of, of course, and are being used in the UK and elsewhere. One of those that is very famous um, was developed at Oxford University and is, of course, the AstraZeneca vaccine. So we're very lucky to actually have a member of, of the team on our, on our panel, um, Teresa. Uh, Teresa, can you tell us a bit about your journey in developing the AstraZeneca COVID vaccine? You, you mentioned that it was... You, you had a system that was sort of almost ready to, to take off the shelf and, and, and trial. How, where do you start with that when it's a, a new virus? Um, well, it starts with you being a protective and nosy older sister, to be perfectly honest. Um, <laughs> my brother was living in Shanghai at the time that uh, SARS-CoV-2 started to emerge. Um, and I always kind of followed any emerging or outbreak pathogens in China because of him principally. And also because there had been avian influenza outbreaks there, such as H7N9 and others that we were interested in. So um, I was following uh, the, this emerging virus on Twitter back when the information was very, uh, when it was pleasant. And um, what then happened was in January, around January 10th, 11th, the information that I needed to make the vaccine, because we had this platform technology that I'd already, I've already discussed, the information I needed for us to make the vaccine against SARS-CoV-2 arrived in my inbox. And as you said, because we'd been doing it for a number of years and we had this platform to go with, myself and a co-worker spent the weekend, designed, almost picked the last ingredient for the vaccine, um, ordered what we needed. So in, ordered the ingredients on the Monday and started the vaccine development then. Um, you obviously need to test vaccines uh, preclinically, so in animal models, before they go into humans. So I oversaw some of that work and drove some of that work. And then for the clinical trial, which started, it was a year last Friday, we had a celebration. It was the first time we vaccinated and it was April 23rd last year. Um, we, um, you obviously, when you vaccinate, the immune system starts to get tickled up and you need to measure it. So you need to measure whether you're making antibodies, whether you're measuring new, making neutralizing antibodies and whether you're making T cells. And I've overseen the delivery of that program. And uh, more fortunately for me, I've been able to do that with some great colleagues in AstraZeneca and around the world. So it's been a huge team effort, um, but I've been involved from the get-go um, because I'm a nosy older sister, to be honest. <laughs> well, congratulations on that. At what point were you confident that this was going to going to work? I mean, that first weekend, I assuming you had no idea whether this was going to work or, or did you always think, well, we've got the technology, it should work? So I, I, I never gave a percentage guess of whether I thought it would work or not. Um, I knew I could make a vaccine because that's what I'd done and we make vaccines. Did I know it would be effective? Did I know uh, we would have efficacy? No, that's what you need clinical trials for and you need clinical trials for, to test for safety as well. So we needed those trials to really test for it. And I'm not a gambling one, woman, so mm -hmm. I, I never put a percentage or a bet on. And what is the difference between the way that this vaccine and some of the other COVID vaccines works? Um, so our vaccine, our, our platform technology, as I've somewhat described, is a, a crippled virus. So it's a crippled adenovirus. And we encode a very small part of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus, the spike protein, in our platform technology. And the difference with ours and some of the other licensed um, vaccines, um, other licensed vaccines use RNA technology. So essentially they get that message into cells in a different way. And then there are protein vaccines um, that are also being used. And then I'm, I'm not sure what Peter platform, what platform he's using, but you can also use inactivated vaccines where you can inactivate the SARS-CoV-2 virus and you can use that as a vaccine. Peter, what, what have you been working on? What's yours? So our vaccine is, is a, kind of an older school technology vaccine. It's a recombinant protein vaccine that's produced by microbial fermentation and yeast. Uh, so it's the same technology used to make the recombinant hepatitis B vaccine that's been around for almost 40 years. And, um, and the, What's good about it, it's pretty easy to scale up 
uh, and produce, and uh, it's got a well-known uh, safety profile, at least for hepatitis B. So we, we've been working on recombinant protein vaccines for our global health vaccines for parasitic disease because they're inexpensive and we can do it for a dollar, two dollars a dose. And that's what we know how to do. And we've been making SARS-1 vaccines and MERS vaccines using that approach, inducing high levels of virus neutralizing antibody. And when, um, like Tess says, when she saw the COVID-19 sequence, I think a lot of us figured we, we, we could do this. And because we just had to uh, re, revise our platform to make it specific for the SARS coronavirus type two. So uh, I, the first person I called when I saw the sequence was my science partner for the last 20 years, Mary Elena Batazzi, Dr. Batazzi. And we got to work as, as quickly as we could and wound up making a pretty good prototype vaccine that we now uh, provided to Biological E in Hyderabad and they're scaling it up uh, for a billion doses. And I'm sure Tess has the same experience. Uh, you know, I've never made a billion of anything before. We've <laughs> we've made vaccines that you know, get into phase two, phase phase one, phase two trials. So this is exciting. It's also scary, and um, and it's looking really good in phase one and phase two trials. We, in biological E um, in Hyderabad has just announced it'll go into phase three trials with the hope uh, that if it all all the stars align, we could release it for emergency use in India by by this summer. So it requires an extra step because you have to actually make the protein and that's why we can't move as quickly as uh, the platform for the mRNA and the adenovirus. On the other hand, the nice thing about it is there's no upper bound to how much you can make. You can just make buckets of these recombinant proteins. So it's a recombinant protein on an adjuvant known as alum formulated with something called CPG oligonucleotide, which is a, 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 a toll-like receptor agonist. And, and that's actually the most expensive part of the vaccine. So it's, it'll be, a, it'll be a, hope, we're hoping we could do it for $1.50 a dose of which the most expensive part is the oligonucleotide, but the, cause the hepatitis yeah. B vaccine you can make for uh, very, very inexpensively. And so you're trying to make that very cheaply, as as have the um, um, as, as is it as with the AstraZeneca vaccine. And we often hear that no one is safe until the whole world is is safe. And of course, we want to save as many lives as possible. But I wonder, Peter, if I could get you to explain why, even from a selfish perspective, why is it so crucial for every country that every other country has vaccines too? If you vaccinate all of your own country, why does it matter so much about everywhere else? Well, it's in the enlightened self-interest of, of both the UK and the US, for instance, to see the whole world vaccinated. First of all, um, by the summer, I'm optimistic both the US and the UK will be fully vaccinated and business will start to return and people will start to travel. But where do you travel to? Um, you, you can travel to, uh, to the US, to Canada, to the UK, to a few Western European countries in Israel. And so just in terms of the economy, it's going to go up and then it'll plateau very quickly because it'll be still be very difficult to do business with Africa and Latin America and, and, and many parts of Asia. That's problem one. Problem two, we have the continued evolution of the virus into the, the variants of concern. And we need to slow that virus transmission down as, as, as much as possible. And, and the only way to do that really is to vaccinate uh, large, large populations. So both for uh, global security, for uh, uh, economic reasons, and, and the driver for all of us, of course, is the humanitarian concern. I mean, our hearts are breaking when we see what's happening in India right now is is health systems which are fragile to begin with in India become completely overwhelmed. And the, the videos, the photos that we're seeing going on in India right now is just so awful. And, and what's, what's quite interesting is both Tess and I, we've transferred our technologies to India because they are one of the big producers of vaccines. So the Serum Institute of India is producing the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, Biological is producing our vaccine as well as the J&J &J vaccine. And the hope is that we can give them all the tools they need to accelerate this very quickly. The other thing I'm concerned about is the original plan for vaccinating the world depended heavily on Indian producers because uh, Indi India produces about half the world's vaccines to begin with. And now we have this very concerning uh, halt on exporting vaccine from India imposed by the prime minister 
uh, in order to keep the doses in India so we can vaccinate India. So now there's a domino effect because who's going to provide AstraZeneca vaccine or our vaccine or the others to Africa and to Latin America? So this is, this is a full-on global crisis, unfortunately. Yeah. And Andreas, there is uh, a lot of work going on around COVID-19, as I said, in different labs um, at the Crick. I'd like to ask you about some of that work. Um, there is research happening there that's relevant to um, vaccines, isn't there? Spike protein research. Yes. Um, I mean, to be quite honest, there isn't really that much directly trying to make vaccines, but mm -hmm. um, I think um, we do exactly what Theresa and Peter describe, and that is... Um, whatever you know how to do anyway, you apply this to the virus now. And so that is what really happens in our institute now. So we have a, um, we have a very strong track record of um, structural work. So to really understand how, how the molecules are formed and uh, they've done that for all sorts of um, flu surface proteins um, over the years. And um, so the structure folks went to um, try to, um, to find out the exact structure of the spike protein. And um, that's, of course, really useful, A, because you, um, it helps you to understand what really happens in the moment when the virus stocks onto a cell. Um, and because that's not the end of it, the spike protein then has a lot of functions to make the proper um, um, infection happen. But it also means you have a map, you know, if you now read about a new variant that has a mutation in um, 501 of the spike, you can just go to your structure and say, okay, 501 is here. And uh, then you can say, okay, the antibodies that we've um, modeled onto this structure or even uh, done the structure of the combination of the antibody and the spike, you can then say, okay, if my antibody binds here and spike is here and the mutation is right here, that could be a problem. If the mutation is down here, that may not be a problem. So you can really use this um, as, a, as a physical model almost to, uh, to kind of say, um, should we worry about this specific um, mutation in terms of the antibodies um, not functioning anymore, yes or no? This is a big part. Another big part is um, something that is um, really COVID specific and vaccines have not much to do with this um, really. And that's the immunopathology. So, um, I mean, lots of people will have heard that um, among the ways we try to treat COVID-19 are um, anti-inflammatories like dexamethasone, um, trying to block um, pro-inflammatory molecules that are produced by the immune system. So there's certainly, um, in, a, in a large fraction of people who get really severe disease, you have this overshoot of the immune response. And so several people among them, also us, um, but um, also big clinical groups try to really um, analyze in, in high detail the immune response that you get, try to understand which part of that immune response is really useful and which is useless and which is actually um, deleterious. And um, that is also, I mean, that, so that's important for, for concrete reasons in two ways, essentially. One is you want to be able to predict, of course, um, who will get really severe COVID-19. So do you have a way to say, when people walk into the hospital, I do one or two tests, and that is going to tell me whether or not in two weeks' time they're back home and happy, or they will be in, in an ICU. Um, so prediction, and of course, you also in order to, to intervene and block parts of the immune response, that's a very, very delicate thing in a way, because you need the immune response um, against the virus. Um, so to come in with bits that inhibit that is um, you really need to know what you're doing. And uh, so a lot of people try to understand that. Um, there are, um, there's really interesting work on trying to um, understand how the virus interacts with cells, and that, um, again, would allow you to defined. So since um, um, a virus essentially is a, is a parasite, so it can't do anything without having using the cell machinery for its own uh, replication. And that means if you understand which of the which parts of the cellular machinery are really uh, necessary for the virus to, to function, you can try and um, find inhibitors to these um, cellular um, proteins and by um, that way, then block the uh, virus to, to go on. 
Uh, there's a lot of um, work in virus um, evolution as well, because we do a lot of sequencing, because we do a lot of PCR tests for lots of hospitals and for, for working here. So th this is also happening. And um, another fairly important thing is, a uh, very important thing is to look at how COVID develops in people with other diseases. So there is a strong interest in, in, in cancer in this institute. And um, one of the big questions was really, um, how do uh, people with cancer fare um, with COVID-19? And so one of the outcomes of uh, one of those studies, for instance, was that in, in particular in cancer patients, the, um, if you only get one shot, your antibody response appears to um, wane rather quickly. So um, people, it's really a case for can cancer patients to get the second shot in time and early enough to, to boost the antibody response. So it's clear that so many different areas of research that were already going on then become oh, absolutely. Very relevant yeah, and, um, when you have a new I mean, virus. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, this is partly, as um, Peter said, I mean, partly for moral reasons. I mean, you want to be helpful uh, if you want also for practical reasons, because I mean, our institute, like I think many other institutes were essentially, there was a moment last year in the first UK lockdown when um, our institute was closed for business in a way, except if you worked on COVID. So um, since scientists like to do stuff, um, a lot of people who otherwise work on, on a neurodegeneration or development, um, they would say, maybe, maybe I have some skill that I can apply here and that would allow me to go back to the lab and try something else rather yeah. than sit at home and get depressed. So this is certainly a, a, strong, yeah. a strong factor in this as well. Yeah, yeah, and we're, we're yes, we're we're lucky that they have. And Peter, in your work as well as 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 doing things like you know working on developing vaccines, you've worked a lot on trying to tackle some of the misinformation that's out there um, on vaccines and looking at, at vaccine hesitancy. What what is the best way of tackling it if if people are hesitant? Well, I wish I had the answer, um, partly because the, the nature of vaccine hesitancy and, and refusal does change, and, um, and it's changed considerably uh, during this uh, pandemic. And, we're, it's, and, it comes, and it doesn't all speak with one voice. It comes from uh, different groups. I think one is the fact that, unfortunately, <laughs> right now, it, it, the anti-vaccine sentiments dominate the internet right now. The uh, Center for Countering Digital Hate just reported that um, if you look at the top 12 uh, anti-vaccine um, uh, Twitter sites, uh, not just Twitter, social media sites, they have 58 million followers. So um, unfortunately, we're just inundated with uh, misinformation and disinformation, disinformation being deliberate. So we've got dedicated anti-vaccine groups that are, no, are not grassroots organizations. These are highly influential, well-funded, well-organized uh, organizations. We also have state actors too now with the both U.S. and British intelligence report that the Russian government is one of the largest promoters of what's being called weaponized health communication. And now we have new information showing that the Russian intelligence is actually specifically targeting, for instance, the AstraZeneca vaccine and the J&J &J vaccine uh, in order to prop up their own adenovirus vectored vaccine, which is known as Sputnik V. And so that's really concerning uh, as, as well. And then finally, here in the U.S., we have the... Um, uh, the, this very interesting politicization of the anti-vaccine movement. Um, it's, this started about five or six years ago here in Texas, where I am. So I was acutely aware of it. They, they took this political, once you know, the original assertion was that vaccines cause autism and a number of us worked to debunk that. I have a daughter with autism and I wrote a book with the straightforward title, Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's uh, Autism which may be a big target for the anti-vaccine community. In fact, one of the lead anti-vaccine activists, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., publicly calls me the OG villain, which I had to look up. It means the original gangster villain. So, so you've, you've been, Claudia, you've invited the original gangster villain here to your, <laughs> to your panel. I hope, hope you know that. And, and do you find and, yourself a target now for talking about COVID vaccines? Oh, absolutely. So, well, now, you know, we, we help diffuse a lot of the, the, 
the craziness around vaccines and autism and because I pointed out the, the massive literature showing there's no link and the lack of plausibility because what we know about how autism begins in early fetal brain development and through the action of more than 100 genes and and we had some success, but then it took this to re-energize, it took this political turn, it glommed on to the far right wing of the Republican Party in, in, in Texas and in Oklahoma, known as the Tea Party. And that has given it new life. And unfortunately, what was initially converted, focused on the far right, the far right extreme of the Republican Party has now become mainstream. And so that right now in the US, the biggest vaccine hesitant group by far with four separate independent news polls, finding that Republicans are the most vaccine hesitant group. 40 to 50% of people who identify as Republicans are refusing to take the vaccine. And we're seeing this play out now on, on Fox News and, and other conservative news outlets, you know, going on anti-vaccine rants. So that's kind of the triple-headed monster that we see right now, the, the, the focused anti-vaccine groups, the um, which have a lot of power and clout. We have the 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 state actors like the Russian government and and now um, the 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 conservative element in in the United States politics yeah. and and chipping yeah. away at that is is really tough work. Yeah, and of course, meanwhile, lots of people are quietly going and getting their their vaccines as well. We've got lots and lots of questions that have come in, um, and so we thought we thought we'd do. I'd love to do one more quick poll, if you don't mind, which is we're really interested to know from the audience here uh, what people's intentions are, um, whether they would like to get vaccinated or not, or or have been. Um, so we're going to put a poll up now, um, and the options are: so this is, do you intend to be vaccinated against uh, COVID nineteen? I have already been vaccinated, so whether that's one dose or two, just say say yes if you've had one, at least. Um, yes, I intend to be vaccinated when it's my turn. No, I don't intend to be vaccinated or I'm undecided. So I wonder if you could uh, put your answer into those. I'm going to put my answer in now. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what happens there. But we have lots of questions. So let me uh, take uh, some of these. Oh, here's an interesting one. Um, Andreas, I wonder if you would know this answer to this. Um, given that it takes a couple of weeks to build up immunity when you have a COVID vaccine, why don't we get side effects for this entire time? So, you know, some people have a sore arm at the beginning or feel a bit unwell, but that doesn't go okay. on for a couple oh, of weeks. That's a wonderful one. Mm. I like this one. Um, it is so... Um, what I've shown you in the in the beginning, if if the person was here, the um, the reason you are not um, um, protected right away, but it takes some time, is really that you have to um, get the um, the antibodies um, out of this huge diversity that I showed initially. So you have um, one part of your immune system has essentially preformed antibodies um, made by different cells. You have to pick out the right ones to um, have them grow and make them more antibodies. And that is really why it takes some time um, for the protection to come along, because only once you have made uh, out of a cell that is one in a, in 10 million, you have made it um, to one in a thousand, um, then you get enough antibody made to, to get protected. And the T cells that we talked about is just a mirror image of the same principle. Same thing happens there. The response that you get in your arm or the fever that you get is a completely different arm of the immune system. It's an older arm. It's a less specific. It's called innate immunity. And that is really um, what existed already before we had this complicated um, diverse, diversifying system to simply say, oh, something's going wrong. We need um, to kind of throw the, the sink at this. So it's um, really the, um, the, the early reaction uh, that we get um, is coming from a completely different part of the immune system than the, the late um, increase in, in protection. And uh, the second part is called adaptive immunity because it can adapt uh, to what you've seen in your life and uh, will change according to your biography of um, infections that, or vaccinations that you had essentially. Yeah, so that makes sense of, of why, it's, why it's then a difference. Um, yeah. uh, Tess, let me ask you uh, this one. Um, Peter says, could, could, um, could you explain what does the efficacy of a vaccine actually mean? Because sometimes you see very different figures. Sometimes the word effectiveness is used. Sometimes efficacy is, mean, is used. What does it mean when we see these percentages? OK, so the first statement I'm going to make is probably the most important, and that is these vaccines work, uh, but they only work if they're in your arm. Um, so I think 
we, when we reported our data, we caused a little confusion. Um, and if I bring you step by step through the different numbers that we talked about, whereas other clinical trials reported one number. So in our trial, we had two different regimes. So two different ways to vaccinate individuals. We had more than those, but in the efficacy readouts, we had two different regimes. And we gave individuals what we called a low dose followed by a standard dose. And that was a half dose followed by a full dose. And then the second regime that we reported efficacy on, we had two standard doses. And in those two different regimes, we had different efficacy. So basically how protected individuals were against um, getting uh, COVID-19 as we defined it in the protocol. And what we saw was individuals who had a half dose followed by a normal standard dose, the efficacy was in and around 90%. For the two standard doses, the efficacy was in and around 60%. And when you combine those numbers, you had a 70% number. And that was the interim efficacy. So that wasn't even the final efficacy. So instead of reporting one number, we reported those three numbers. And I think that we uh, confused some people. At the time, we weren't sure why we were getting those, those differences in efficacies. But what we've done since then is we've looked at the data and we've observed that when you increase the interval, so the amount of time between your first and your second dose, you increase the efficacy and you increase the amount of antibodies you're producing. So in our regime where we had a half dose followed by a standard dose in the 90%, we had longer dose intervals. So there were normally eight to 12 weeks. So data that I normally focus on when I'm trying to explain about these vaccines work and we need to get them, are the real world effectiveness data. And this is the data that has come from Public Health Scotland, Public Health England, from lots of different public health authorities, showing that our most elderly, our most vulnerable and our most frail individuals are even being protected against hospitalization and severe disease after one dose of these vaccines. So I think um, we got a little bit hung up on all the numbers, me included, um, and we need to just look at the impact that these vaccines are having on people's lives and are most frail. Yes, because it's one of the difficulties that sometimes it's referred to as whether it means people might contract COVID at all. Sometimes percentages are about hospitalizations or deaths or so um, serious disease. Yeah. Absolutely, and that's a really important point because if you look at different clinical trials, different trials will define COVID-19 differently. So that's why I think looking at real world data where these vaccines have been rolled out into older adults, the most vulnerable, um, can be the most informative. Um, and there's quite a few questions here about mixing and matching different vaccines. Um, and um, uh, who would like to take this test as this one, this one, maybe this is one for you as well. Um, lots of people say, well, why not have one dose of one and one dose of another? That might be better. Sure. Um, so we have done some work in the preclinical space. So we've looked at animal models of this and you do get strong immunity if you mix and match. But really what we need to do is we need to do those clinical trials to look and see if the reactogenicity, so whether mixing and matches um, actually makes a vaccine that is more reactive, well, the side effects more reactogenic. And we also need to look at the immunogenicity. And those studies um, have been started in Oxford and they're being run by a colleague of mine, Matthew Snape. Um, and there's an awful lot of questions coming his way. So I'm sure he's going to get something out as quickly as he can. So the results, I don't know if you guys can see them. 76% um, say that they've been vaccinated already. 21% um, intend to be vaccinated. 1% uh, does not intend to be vaccinated and 3% um, undecided. So a total of 4% who, whom we have to work on to convince them that uh, vaccines are really a good thing. So maybe, I, I mean, just to, to add on to, to what you said, Tessa, I mean, I think it is interesting that a lot of prime boost um, regimens, so the ideas on how you do vaccinations well, um, really rely on the idea that you'd use a different um, type of vaccine in the first go and in the second go. So all the people who've tried DNA with protein, et cetera, et cetera. So I find it uh, quite an attractive idea to mix them and um, try different ways. I do think we need to see what the reactogenicity and immunogenicity looks like from these trials. So before, right. um, and those studies are ongoing. So hopefully they'll yeah. be that soon. 
Um, okay. But yes, I agree. I'm hugely interested too. Yeah. How yeah. Because Prime Boost is a, is a great area. Now my my uh, connection went for a while then, but everyone carried on going. So that that's <laughs> um, that's marvelous. Um, and um, Peter, do we know how effective? Here's a question from Jennifer. Do we know how effective current COVID vaccines are to emerging variants that are happening? Well, in some cases, we have uh, actual clinical trial data uh, to look at that. For instance, the J and J vaccine does have reduced efficacy against the South African variant. Uh, same with the Novavax uh, vaccine, and same with the AstraZeneca vaccine, possibly our vaccine as well. So the, the good news is that most of the original prototype vaccines that were developed for the original lineages seem to protect just as well or almost as well as the against the B117 variant that first arose out of Southern England. And that's that's the one accelerating the most um, in, in many parts of Europe and the United States now as well, as well as in, in Israel and possibly even India, even though there's the Maharashtra strain that many people talk about, the B117 variant is still dominant. So the good news um, for is that for now, our, our most of our vaccines sh should be protective. Now, later on, uh, some of these other variants that have additional amino acid substitutions, like the one from South Africa, the P1 from Brazil, possibly the Maharashtra strain from India, we might have to develop boosters that will be redesigned to be more specific for a combination of those variants. And so that if you've got two doses of the Moderna Pfizer vaccine, you might get a third dose, or if you've got a single dose of the J&J &J vaccine, a second dose. And that and uh, that booster will be slightly reconfigured to be more specific for the variant. And then the question that always follows is, okay, so what does that mean? We, are we going to do this dance every year now like we do for influenza? And the com scientific community um, is a bit divided on that. Um, I know Pfizer, for instance, is already in have plans to co-formulate their mRNA vaccines with uh, influenza vaccine. That's been reported in anticipation of that possibility. I'm actually more optimistic it may not be necessary just because of all of the convergence we're seeing of the variants. It's not like we're seeing amino acid substitutions all over the place. We're seeing repeated motifs so that you know, maybe it's overly optimistic. I think it's possible that if we can develop this one-time booster, we may be out of it for a while. And and but we'll see. Uh, this is, you know, that's the problem with the with pandemics. They set you up to make you look stupid. And um, uh, uh, but uh, we're doing our best. And I think that may be the case that we may not necessarily need to design a new vaccine every year. So I'd be hopeful too, Peter, that we wouldn't necessarily need a vaccine every year. Um, I think it's one of those situations where we will have to wait and see though. But hopefully you're right. Yeah, and, and this is where public health communication is so important because, because there's going to have to be this iterative process with the scientific community and public health community explaining to people in the UK, United States, and globally, um, how this is being done, why it's being done. So science communication has never been more important. And, and I think one of the good, if there's any silver lining uh, on this pandemic, and there are not many, I think it's that general audiences are getting used to hearing from scientists, not, not having everything filtered through, through intermediaries. And, and the other thing I think we're learning is the, the, the public doesn't mind the complexity. They're, they're okay with it because they need to know about it for, for, for the health of themselves or their loved ones. And, and I think for me, an important lesson is going to be, we need to kind of build that back into scientific training. No, I agree. And, and I have to admit that I've, I've never done so much scientific communication in my life as I have in the last year. And actually, one thing that it has taught me is you need to be able to communicate what you're doing and what the work is and why it's important. And you need to explain it almost at a level that an eight year old or a 12 year old can understand, because children are hugely influential in educating parents as well. So, um, yeah, I try out uh, a lot of lectures on my children. I think they're bored about COVID and hearing about vaccines. <laughs> well, I think, Apologies, I mean, I'm just for a moment. And sorry, Andreas. 
the the other thing so talking about communication i think the the important thing is really to to make it normal for people out there that scientists say we don't know or what we thought is right till yesterday we know today i was wrong um that this is part of the normal scientific process that this is how science has always worked and should work and so that you um that people like peter says not only get used to complexity but really also get used to the fact that um the truth today may uh, not be the truth tomorrow anymore because we found out something more and something new um, so that it is possible for us to go out there and not just say here we know it we explain it to you that's it but really say yeah we know a little bit but um, we try to know more but um, we we may go the wrong way or someone else may go the right way. Yeah, I think it's a big challenge, isn't it? When the science is happening so fast now and there are so many preprints and things are things are coming out very, very fast and, and things change, then there's it's it's difficult to communicate that, that that is the case, that things change. I want to ask each of you a, a, a final question, um, which is uh, what do you think that the future looks like for the COVID-19 vaccines and also for vaccines in general? You know, will we now we've we've had so much uh, success, if you like, with the COVID vaccines. Will this then spill across to other vaccines? Where, where do you think we're going next? Um, uh, uh, Tess? Um, I'm going to start with one word and it's busy. <laughs> That's what my world looks like at the moment. Um, I'm really hopeful um, that we learn from what we've done and not just learn from making vaccines, but also around communication, that we don't just um, almost run off into the sunset because the pandemic is nearing an end or lockdown is lifting because so many people have worked so hard and sacrificed so much that it would be a disservice for us not to take the lessons we've learned and be better prepared. I don't want my children or any of our children to have to develop a vaccine the way we have and we need to empower the next generation of scientists so that they can do what we did better and faster and work as a team. And Andreas, what would you say? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually quite optimistic. I think this, um, I mean, the, the vaccine field is an interesting field. Since you give vaccines to healthy people, the, the, the safety requirements are incredibly high and that's how it should be. But that of course also means that um, innovation really hits very, very high hurdles. And um, for instance, there, there are components in vaccines called adjuvants. And um, among immunologists, we often say the adjuvants today in use who have been in tens of millions of people would not get approved today because um, the requirements are incredibly high of what you have to show. So I think it takes crises to, to bring the technology forward. And this is exactly what we're looking at. So we have seen now that um, RNA-based vaccines um, can get into people, they are safe, they give you a wonderful, wonderful immune response, they do something that hardly any vaccine did before, and that is the T-cell response that we were mentioning today, and um, a lot of the classical vaccines wouldn't give you this. So I think in the future there will be, these new technologies will be used for a lot of the, for flu, they will be used for sure, and um, one of the beauties, like um, in particular Theresa mentioned, um, it is, a, it is a technology that can is very adaptable and can very quickly be changed. So if you need um, a completely new flu, flu vaccine um, because you have a pandemic coming along, you can probably do that much more easily based on the RNA technology. And Peter, I know you've got to go. So a final, a final thought from you about the future for, for COVID-19 vaccines or other vaccines. Well, I think, you know, the scientific community responded bigly, as we say, um, the, you know, we've produced a lot of interesting, highly innovative uh, vaccines, and there's no question the field has been advanced. Um, what I worry, of course, though, is the equity issue, where while although almost a billion doses of vaccine is produced, all, overwhelmingly, it's gone to the Northern Hemisphere, to the US, the UK, Europe, and when you look at the percentage of people vaccinated in, in, in Africa, Latin America, the low income countries of Asia, it's pathetically small and we've got to fix that. And, and I think, you know, maybe 
bringing in some simpler, uh, uh, older school technology vaccines will help in that as well. I think that's one. Second, we've got to do something about the anti-vaccine empire now, which is what it's become, either because now it's working to discredit the AstraZeneca and J&J vaccine. We're already hearing that doses are going unused in Africa. This is this is a killer. So, and I have an article out called "Anti-Science Kills," and that that's what I mean. And then I think the other is. I really like what Oxford did, which was transfer technology to the Serum Institute of India, one of the world's largest producers. I would just say we need more serum institutes. We need right now, no, no vaccines are made on the African continent. Um, not Latin America is not much better. And, and so that's got to be a, a major priority. Well, thank you so much to Teresa Lam, Peter Hotez and Andreas Back, and to the organisers, Anne O'Gara at Crick Research, Jenny Jobson and Rosie Waldron from Crick Public Engagement, Louise Howitt from Crick Events, and Yvonne Bordon and Zoltan Ferrari from Nature Research, and Jenny Evans and Doug Brown from the British Society of Immunology. It took a lot, a lot of people involved. Um, the Crick is evaluating this event and they'd love to know what you think. Um, you can click the link in the Zoom chat if you'd like to access a short survey or look out for it on email. I promise it only takes a few minutes. And of course, we hope that one day soon you'll be able to come back to the Crick for events and exhibitions um, in person. But in the meantime, if you want more, you can can see past events about the Crick's COVID-19 research by visiting uh, the Crick's YouTube channel and there you can find amongst other things COVID conversations featuring Crick scientists in conversation with Lauren Laverne and Dara O'Brien and others and you can stay up to date with what's happening at Crick by signing up to the mailing list which you can do via the feedback survey or through the Crick website but Thank you so much um, to everyone for all your brilliant questions. I know there were loads more there. Um, we could have done hours of this. Um, and thank you um, so much. Peter had to go, but thank you so much to Andrea and Teresa as well. Thanks, bye-bye. Thank